Johnny Two-Face here, back with another reaction video. This time we're reacting to The Decemberist Part 1, Russia's First Revolutionaries by Epic History TV. So, judging by the title, they're talking about the first Russian revolution, because for any of those who know uh, even remotely a little bit about Russia's history, they had two revolutions. The second one is when the Bolsheviks came in and made um, Russia a common... Uh, the world's first communist country. I hope I remembered that right. Um, so, um, so this, by the looks of it, this will go into more detail about um, the people behind Russia's first revolution. So, um, so the usual disclaimer when I react to anything historical, if I don't show so much what is considered a proper reaction, is probably obvious. I don't know much about the subject at hand, and if I do know anything. I'll most likely pause the video to give my input or ask any curious questions which hopefully we answer in the comments below. So that being said, the link to the original video in the description down below. Please go and subscribe to Epic History TV, one of the best history channels here on YouTube and um, excuse me, feel free to go and check out and support their channel as best you can and um, without rambling on too long let's get this up on screen and let's see what happens. 1815, so this 1815. is a so start with Alexander. At the Battle of Waterloo, mm -hmm. French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte suffers his final defeat, and two decades of war in Europe come to an end. The victorious powers, led by Austria, mm -hmm. Britain, Prussia and Russia, meet at Vienna to decide the fate of Europe. The frontiers Congress of nations Vienna. and empires are redrawn, mm -hmm. while Emperor Alexander of Russia adds King of Poland to his list of titles. Did... I don't know how long the Russian hatred for Poland lasted, but I still stand by my point that Poland is probably one of the most screwed over nations in Europe. But I know, I know. People have already told me, and I have seen them um, that when the when um, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth took Moscow and then got beaten back. But ever since then, Russia seemed to have a quite a bit of hatred for Poland, even though they've defeated them, especially among the Russian elite. But it's kind of debatable how much hatred the Russians had for Poland among the ordinary folk especially the, the the Russian royal family and the Russian nobles despised Poland and that was one of the reasons why they they um, broke their alliance with Napoleon and France because of uh, the du the creation of Duchy of Warsaw was as they called meddling in their own front yard But anyway, that's... He also oversees creation of a holy alliance to ensure that no more revolutions threaten Europe's established... But I suppose calling himself not just the Tsar of Russia, but King of Poland, there must have been real salt in the wound for, for, po for, for, Pol for the people of Poland. ...order. The Russian Empire, after many great sacrifices mm. in the wars against Borodino Napoleon, emerges more Moscow. powerful than ever. Mm. But not everyone in Russia is pleased with the nope. new state of affairs. Once they get that taste of liberalism, it's going to kick off. A group of young army officers mm. dream of a different future for Russia. Yeah. A new form of government, radical reforms, even a Russia without a Tsar. F for anyone who knows about the Second Russian Revolution, you should know where this is. This will probably end up in the future. Probably a better way to say that, but. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. 
these days more and more people are joined. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Feel free to check video. out NordVPN if you're interested. In 1812, Napoleon had invaded Russia with the largest army Europe had ever seen. It was a defining moment in his reign. Yeah, it was like, what, 650,000? Over half a million? But he underestimated Russian mm. resolve. And they weren't prepared for Russia's skir sk skir scorched earth policy. Four months later, mm -hmm. the remnants of his army began yep. its infamous retreat from Moscow. Correct me if I'm wrong, Half over half a million went into Russia and I think, what, only 20,000 came back if you don't count the stragglers? That was just brutal to watch. If you haven't seen my reaction to the Napoleonic series by Epic History TV, I suggest you go and check that out before checking this out. The Russian army and its coalition mm. allies then drove Napoleon's forces back across Europe, yep. fighting giant battles in Germany, and finally arriving in the streets of Paris itself. Mm -hmm. Napoleon's abdication was a moment of triumph for Emperor Alexander and for Russia. For many young Russian officers, it was also an eye-opening experience. Imperial Russia was an autocracy. Mm -hmm. ruled by an emperor with no checks upon his power. There was no political opposition or constitution. Nope. There was no freedom of speech or right to trial. Approximately 80% of Russians were serfs, mm -hmm. peasants with no rights, freedom or hope of betterment, their status passed down to their children. Mm -hmm. The inefficiency, not to mention injustice of such a system, was increasingly apparent even to many Russian aristocrats. In Europe, like they cared. Serving as officers in the Russian army, they'd visited countries where serfdom had been swept aside by war and revolution, and where monarchs had granted constitutions that limited their power, protected freedoms, and acknowledged the rule of law. Many were inspired and began to dream of similar reforms in Russia. But few placed faith in Emperor Alexander to aid their cause. You always want to teach me, but I am the Emperor. I desire this, nothing else. And this is what... And this is what causes revolutions from this arrogance. Alexander de Derzhaven, I'll, pro I'll probably butcher that, Minister of Justice. Alexander the Blessed. On the night of the 11th of March, 1801, Alexander's father, Emperor Paul, was strangled to death by a group of disaffected army officers. Wow. Alexander succeeded to the throne, aged just 23. The ineffectiveness and chaos of his father's rule had appalled him. In 1797, he'd written to his tutor, To speak plainly, the well-being of the state is not at all considered in the administration of affairs. There is only absolute power, which does everything wrong and at cross-purposes. The choice of officials is entirely a matter of favoritism. Merit counts for nothing. The farmer is plagued, commerce is hindered, personal liberty and well-being are reduced to nothing. There you have the picture of Russia. Judge how my heart must suffer. The young Alexander displayed a great enthusiasm for reform, an encouraging sign to Russian aristocrats mm. who wished to see a more modern Russian state. In 1803, he passed a decree that gave landowners the right to free their serfs. Mm. Many hoped it was a first step towards the abolition of serfdom. In 1808, the brilliant and liberal-minded Mikhail Speransky became Alexander's chief advisor. He created okay. a new council of state to advise the emperor, and even began working on a Russian constitution. 
But in 1812, Alexander's appetite for reform ended abruptly. Okay. First, an anti-reform faction, led by the Emperor's sister, Grand Duchess Ekaterina Pavlovna, engineered Speransky's dismissal. Then, Napoleon invaded Russia. In this moment of supreme crisis, Alexander was seized by religious fervor, a sense of oh personal dear. mission and national destiny. The burning of Moscow, he declared, had illuminated his soul. Liberal reforms, he could now see, were only the road to anarchy and chaos. They were an intolerable risk to Russia. Religious and political arrogance. As holy Sorry, institutions. That, that, that's In how it 1815, looks. any officers returning from Europe harboring hopes of reform were to be severely disappointed. Hmm. Alexander added insult to injury by granting a liberal constitution, not to Russia, but to his new kingdom, Poland. Wow. Not one, it turned out, he planned to honour. Hmm. Three years later, when Alexander raised the possibility of a Russian constitution, based on this Polish experiment, it proved an empty promise. Idealistic young officers, mm. more alienated than ever, decided that if the Emperor would not take up their cause, they must act themselves. They began to organise secret societies, and to plan a revolution. Another reason why pol politics and religion should never mix. And arrogance of this magnitude. It's just... Sh I'm sorry if it upsets anyone, but that's how it looks. We do not fear death on the battlefield, but we're afraid to speak out in favour of justice. Kondrat... Kond Kondrati Raliyev, poet and Decemberist. The Union of Salvation. Many Russian military officers already belonged to a secret society. Okay. Freemasonry had been imported from Europe in the 18th century and was popular among army officers. Mm. But in 1816, officers from Russia's prestigious Guards regiments, based in St. Petersburg, formed a new secret society, the Union of Salvation. Four of its founding members would play a leading role in a revolutionary movement that became known as the Decemberists. Nikita Muravyov, a captain in the Guards Division staff, aged 31 at the time of the Decemberists' revolt. He would draft one of their major plans for constitutional reform. Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Muravyov Apostol, aged 30 at the time of the revolt. He would lead the Decemberist uprising in Ukraine. Oh, wow. Colonel Prince Sergei Trubitskoy, aged 36 at the time of the revolt. Mm. A war hero from one of Russia's most distinguished families, Trubitskoy would be chosen to lead the Decemberist coup in St. Petersburg. And Colonel Pavel Pestel. Which, if anyone remembers at the time, St. Peter Petersburg was the capital, but Moscow was always the spiritual heart of Russia. Of the Vyatka Infantry Regiment, aged 33 at the time of the revolt. Also a decorated war hero, badly wounded at Borodino. Mm -hmm. He was a brilliant, if uncompromising officer, and one of the most active and radical members of the Union. Mm -hmm. He would argue for the Emperor's death and creation of a Russian Republic. Wow. The Union of Salvation soon merged with another secret society, the Order of Russian Knights, okay. to form the Union of Prosperity, with more than 200 members. Its charter, known as the Green Book, set out how the Union was to be organised. It also spelled out its commitment to educating the public about Enlightenment ideals of virtuous moral citizenship. This, it was hoped, would generate wider support for reform among Russia's elite. Mm. Only a trusted inner circle was privy to the Union's more radical, long-term goals <coughs> of securing a constitution and ending serfdom. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, when um, nations, you know, 
get a taste of that liberalism or fr amount of freedoms and reforms it's it's some it becomes addictive and it's gone and if refused due to arrogance by e either religious or political um reasons eventually it is going to kick off why are Russian people and Russian army unhappy? Because the, the Tsars have stolen their freedom? Uh, yeah. That'll probably be why. The Orthodox Catholicism. The strong man. Architect. The leaders of the Union of Prosperity were wise to be wary. Alexander had tightened censorship laws while allies kept him informed about Russia's supposedly secret societies. Mm. For the moment, he tolerated them, telling one courtier, You who have served me since the beginning of my reign know that I have shared and encouraged all these dreams and delusions. It is not for me to be strict. His new closest advisor, General Alexei Arakchev, felt no such restraint. Mm. Arakchev had masterminded the organization of Russian artillery during the Napoleonic Wars and was famed for ruthless efficiency, a violent temper, wow. and absolute loyalty to the Emperor. He loathed almost anything to do with Western Europe. You yeah. don't get things done by talking softly in French, he once remarked. Arakchev was put in charge of the Emperor's latest idea the so-called military settlements. Mm. The plan was to cut the cost of Russia's huge army by having soldiers and serfs live side by side in mm. new villages organized like military camps with strict discipline. Wow. It was a harsh policy, mm. even by the standards of Russian autocracy, mm. and led to misery, riots, and rising resentment against the regime. And if an you got to question yourself if you're surprised by this. Arakchev also enforced strict new standards of discipline and conduct in the army. The soldiers who had defeated Napoleon were now subjected to endless parades and inspections. Mm. Small infractions were brutally punished. Wow. Officers who spoke out on behalf of their men were dismissed. Mm. In 1820, a protest by the Semyonovsky Lifeguard Regiment, one of the army's senior units, led to even more savage punishments. Mm -hmm. To the Decembrist leaders, it proved that even elite regiments had fallen out of love with the regime. Mm -hmm. They themselves would be acting in a strong Russian tradition of wow. palace coups led by army officers to secure dynastic and political change. Mm. The crucial task was to be ready when the moment came. The Russian people free and independent is not and cannot be the property of any person or any family. Draft comes by Nikita Muryov, the Northern Society. By 1821, the number of new members joining the Union of Prosperity made its founders suspicious of infiltration and discovery. So they dissolved the Union. Its most trusted and committed members formed two new groups, each with around 20 to 30 members. The Northern Society was based in the Russian capital, St. Petersburg, and was initially the more moderate organization. The more radical Southern Society was based in Tolchin, Ukraine, where wow. several Decembrist officers were stationed with their regiments. Mm. Both societies spent their time holding secret meetings at the apartments of their members. They would stay up late into the night discussing political ideas, reading aloud from banned literature, drafting manifestos and resolutions. The Northern Society adopted a draft constitution by Nikita Muravyov as its Muravyov. aims. His moderate document <coughs> would make Russia a constitutional mm. monarchy but was otherwise heavily influenced by the US Constitution of 1787. Okay. He too called for a division of power between executive, legislature, and judiciary, with each imposing checks and balances on the others. 
The executive was the emperor, supreme official of the Russian government, who would command the armed forces, lead foreign policy, and had the power to veto legislation. Mm. The legislature, a people's vietje, or assembly, mm -hmm. composed of a supreme duma, or senate, and a house of representatives. Serfdom would be abolished, and there would be equality before the law. Mm. The right to vote would be restricted to those who owned a certain amount of property, thus excluding the very poorest Russians. The Russian Empire was also to become a federal state of 15 regions, each with their own executives and assemblies. However, in 1823, a new member would take the Northern Society in a much more radical direction. 27-year-old Kondraty Reliev was another... And this is the, the only problem you can see in this, is the divide in between, between the moderates and... Um, correct, me, correct me if I'm wrong, but this will be the... probably start... I can probably see infighting between the moderates and the, and the radicals. The war veteran. Like you see in most revolutions and a famous poet. Mm. He was passionate, eloquent, and devoted to the cause of revolution. He was known for his satire of the hated General Arakchev, mm. secretly circulating amongst Russian liberals. All fear, tyrant, for evil and treachery, thou shalt be condemned by thy posterity. Reliev despised monarchy in all its forms. There are no good governments in the world, except in America, he declared. He proved a highly inf- Um, yeah, good thing he's not around now. ...influential figure, and soon a radical wing of the Northern Society formed mm -hmm. around him, taking up his argument for a Republican revolution. A friend described a meeting at his apartment around this time. There must have been more than a dozen people in the room, but at first I could not distinguish anything because of the dense blue haze of pipe and cigar smoke. They were sprawling on sofas and on the deep window sills. Young Alexander Odoyevsky and Bestuzhev sat cross-legged, Turkish fashion, on a Persian carpet. An intense youth with a pale complexion and prominent forehead lifts a glass. Death to the Tsar! The toast is received with emotion. Mm. Reliev's jet black eyes light up with an inner flame. They sing to the death of the Tsar. Mm -hmm. The rhythmic chant flows through the open windows for all to hear. Wow. The government belongs to the people and was established for the good of the people. The people do not exist for the good of the government. Pavel Pestel, the Southern Society. The leading figure of the Southern Society, based in Ukraine, was Colonel Pavel Pestel. Mm -hmm. He provided the group with its own constitution, Ruskaya Pravda, Russian Truth. Wow. This lengthy, unfinished treatise was much more radical than Muravyov's mm. constitution. There was no place for an emperor in Pestel's new Russia. The former supreme power has already sufficiently proved its hostile feelings towards the Russian people. The current order will cease to exist. Wow. Pestel called for a revolution, spearheaded by a provisional supreme council that would implement gradual but sweeping change. The two main needs for Russia are clear. A complete reorganization of the state order and structure and the publication of a completely new code of laws, while preserving everything that is useful and destroying everything mm. that is harmful. Serfdom would be abolished, land redistributed to the peasants, class privileges abolished, and the vote given to all Russian male citizens. The northern and southern societies remained in close contact, despite major differences of opinion between and within both societies. There was still much that bound them. All desired the abolition of serfdom and conscription, the end of autocratic government, the establishment of new rights and freedoms for the Russian people. What's more, they felt themselves to be in step with a spirit of the age, 
as revolutions and conspiracies spread across Europe in the name of liberty. Such events reaffirmed their conviction that change in Russia must come from direct action. A coup d'etat, or revolution. On the 14th, I will be emperor or dead. Grand Duke Nicholas. In 1825, Pavel Pestel learned that the following spring, Emperor Alexander and his entourage would travel to Ukraine to inspect troops of the Second Army. Pestel formed a plan to assassinate the Emperor and launch a coup to establish a Russian Republic. The date was set, the 12th of March, 1826. After urgent communications with the Northern Society, Relief's faction agreed to launch a simultaneous uprising in the capital, St. Petersburg. But in December, unexpected news threw all their plans into disarray. That winter, Emperor Alexander visited southern Russia, okay. where it was hoped the climate would improve his wife's frail health. Instead, Alexander himself became seriously ill. He died at Taganrog, aged 47. Wow. Typhus was the most likely cause. <coughs> hmm. Alexander's sudden death was a shock to all Russia. The Decembrists had agreed that the best time to force political change was at the succession of a new Tsar. Hmm. Now was their moment. But no one was quite sure who the new Tsar was. Mm -hmm. Alexander had died without legitimate offspring. By the law of succession, he should have been succeeded by the eldest of his younger brothers, Grand Duke Constantine. But Constantine was terrified at the prospect of becoming emperor. I will be strangled, just as my father was strangled, he would say when the subject came up. Wow. So three years before his death, Alexander signed a secret document making his younger brother Grand Duke Nicholas his heir. But when Alexander suddenly died, the new order of succession was still secret, known only to a few members of the imperial family. Okay. All of Russia assumed Constantine was their new emperor. Patriarchs, politicians and troops swore new oaths of loyalty. Even Grand Duke Nicholas swore an oath, mm -hmm. judging it better to observe the usual customs until Alexander's secret document could be made public. But Constantine, based in Warsaw in his role as commander-in-chief of the Polish army, had no intention of taking the throne. Nicholas urged his brother to come to St. Petersburg and publicly renounce the throne to end the confusion. Okay. Constantine refused. I cannot accept your request to come to St. Petersburg and warn you that I shall move even further away unless everything is settled in accordance with the will of our late sovereign. Meanwhile, the Decembrists in St. Petersburg were meeting daily. They had been caught off guard by Alexander's mm. death, but the chaos of the Interregnum provides perfect cover for them. They recruit more officers to their cause, sound out the rank and file, work out who can be relied on and who cannot. Relief works without pause. All are fired with a wild enthusiasm. Mm. That December, Rumours, confusion and fake news swirl around the Russian capital. Grand Duke Nicholas knows he is not popular with the troops. They regard him as another martinet, overly fond of inspections and parades. Now he is told that unknown army officers are actively conspiring against him. He decides to act first. In the early hours of the 14th of December, 1825, Nicholas declares himself Emperor of Russia. He will require an oath of loyalty that morning from all officials and troops in St. Petersburg. The Decembrists know that if the troops swear that oath, their cause is lost. There might not be another opportunity like this in decades. The 14th of December becomes do or die for the revolutionaries. And before the day is out, the streets of the Russian capital 
will run with blood. Oh, wow. Thank you to all the Epic History TV Patreon supporters. And that'll do it. This has been another interesting video by Epic History TV. And, um, yeah, so, um, so I will react to the other episode of this, of, the. Um, of uh, this, um, I don't know, mini series, I suppose. Um, so, um, but as I tried to say earlier, um, I do believe that there, I can't help but feel like there's going to be infighting between the moderates and the uh, uh, extremists. But it, it's still interesting to see, like how, how it's going to go from here, in, in well, in more detail. So, um, so that's that's all i can really add so anyway if you like this reaction please like comment and subscribe and i'll see you in the next video